Welcome to video two of chapter 14. In this video, we will look at unstructured time and then a fair bit uh, will be dedicated to electronic media use. So first of all, as you can see on the screen here, there's been a decrease in unstructured time, especially outdoors over the past 50 years or so. Um, this has been due to mainly safety concerns for one thing. Uh, media use has, has certainly taken some of the time away that uh, from children and adolescents that, that they used to spend outside. And there is more paid work for teenagers today than there was decades ago. And all of this contributes to less unstructured time. Uh, one of the um, advantages of, of adolescents having some amount of unstructured time to just kind of hang out with their peers is that it allows them to develop an identity that's that's separate from their parents. Um, adolescents need some time away from their family and from their parents in order to you know figure out who they are as an individual. And they usually do this during unstructured time with their peers. Um, there has been an initiative in recent years to try to get more children um, outside. Uh, in, in, it's called the Great Outdoors Initiative. Um, they want to make outdoors relevant again to today's young people, make it inviting, exciting, and fun. Ensure that all young people have access to outdoor spaces that are safe, clean, and close to home. Uh, empower and enable youth to work and volunteer in the outdoors and to build a, on a base of environmental and outdoor education, formal and informal. So this has been an initiative that has been going on for a little bit to, to try to get children back outside um, because, you know, because of the, the decrease in outdoor activity that has occurred over recent decades. Um, there was a recent survey, uh, initial survey um, back in um, that covered 2006 to 2010. You know, so this is a, a little bit old, but it showed a, a really steep decline in outdoor participation among children. And um, so, I mean, it was, it was certainly going down downwards. Uh, a more recent survey in 2014 showed that the decline, you know, didn't continue, didn't continue uh, during that survey. So it leveled off somewhat. The decline kind of stopped. Maybe this is partially due to the outdoors initiative that's been going on for, for some years. And uh, certainly if we were to do a, a current survey, I don't, I don't have anything past 2014, but we'd probably, you know, with the pandemic and everything, we'd see once again, another steep decline in, in outdoor participation. Um, there are a number of positive outcomes that research shows when children do, you know, uh, spend time outdoor and outdoors and involved with nature. Some of the ones that, that have been documented uh, are less obesity. Um, one, uh, one thing that can help contribute to that is that they find that, that children are more likely to, to choose and, and enjoy healthy foods if they've actually helped with a school garden, just as an example. And there are some schools uh, that do have their own gardens and, and have um, their students, you know, work in them. Um, and, and this does, you know, besides learning about gardening, I mean, it, it does help to promote healthy eating. Children want to eat things that they helped to, that they contributed to, you know, help, help grow. So um, some other documented findings, greater ability to focus attention, greater self-discipline, lower levels of distress, higher self-worth, and a positive and protective attitude towards the natural world. Uh, one, one more that you could add to this list is they've also found more effective problem solving um, uh, among children that spend more time, out, time outdoors. This probably goes along with the, the greater ability to focus attention, but um, okay. 
Let's go on to electronic media use. One of the things that certainly has taken away from the amount of time that children spend outside is, is their great interest in electronic media use. Uh, forms of media are increasing exponentially. We have more and more and more, you know, electronic gadgets. And um, with the um, with the increase of, of, you know, more television stations, better video game, more and better video games, you know, the, the use of phones and, and everyone having a, a phone. I mean, it's just, this has all contributed to, to increased media use. Um, as it says here, TV is still used most by children. Uh, eight to eight to eighteen year olds average is four and a half hours of TV and videos or DVDs per day. So four and a half hours is a fair bit, I think. Some of it's on handheld devices such as cell phones. Uh, in almost half the homes, the television is all always on. And rules set by parents for media use tend to monitor content, not the amount of time that children spend. And uh, having a TV always on is is uh, certainly not a, a good practice, even if, you know, the, the a child is not actively watching the TV, it's going to be a distraction for them. Um, but the, the good news is that there were 21% that re, the re, reported watching no TV on an average day. Once again, this is between eight, and, 8 to 18 years old. So about one out of every five um, is not, you know, fitting this pattern of watching so many hours per day and, and avoiding TV. As far as um, very young children, the, the American Academy of, of Pediatrics, AAP, they used to recommend no electronic media under the age of two. They were, they were very firm that a child under two should not be exposed to any uh, electronic media. Uh, no one followed that, <laughs> or, or the majority of parents do not follow that. And, and so they end up softening their their recommendation a little bit. So, so now they recommend the parents set appropriate limits on viewing based in part on whether the use of media helps or hinders participation in other activities, and, and they should monitor children's media intake. So, um, so now it's 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 that you they're basically saying that you should not be replacing other activities with TV, if um, and 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 you should certainly should be certainly limiting the time. Uh, infants and toddlers uh, learn much more effectively from having real life interactions with other people, and then no educational media can improve upon playing and interacting, you know, in person with an infant or toddler. So even though you may think, well, I'm giving them quality educational media, if we're looking at infants and toddlers, they really do learn by in-person in -person contact. They're not really taking in the educational content um, of, of the media that, that, that you think may be helping them if they're that young. They do need a lot more in-person experiences. Uh, media consumption increases dramatically as children move into early adolescence. It goes up to um, nine to 12 hours per day, according to one survey of nine to 12 hours per day for all media combined. So, you know, we if we're getting eight hours sleep, then we're awake for 16 hours during the day and, and Young teens are spending nine to twelve of those hours, on average, um, engaged in media consumption. Uh, almost all teens report that they go online every day, and twenty-four percent reported that they are online almost constantly. Um, so there is obviously a, a, a huge online draw for for teenagers. Uh, not only are children and teens using more different forms of media than in the past? They're also more likely to use several of these forms at the same time. 
and engage in multitasking. And this can certainly affect their ability to, to maintain sustained attention on one thing. If you constantly are trying to multitask, you, you're, you're not gaining in your ability to hold sustained attention. So like, you know, in order to, for instance, read a book or do your homework, you know, without distraction. Um, so it is, it is, you know, a bad training um, uh, of the mind for, for, for children, um, children or adolescents to, to be multitasking. Um, other evidence also shows that when we, we don't, when we multitask, we don't engage the deeper processing parts of our brain because we, we, we tend to be flipping back and forth between the tasks when we multi multitask, we use um, a part of our brain that's meant for fast processing. And, and in order to engage a deep processing part of your brain, which, which, which makes information um, more memorable and, and you know, forms more um, solid and consolidated memories, in order to do that, you have to pay attention to one thing you know, for, for a, a sustained amount of time. Okay. Um, there are also effects on physical development. Um, and this is kind of ironic, you know, comparing these, these two findings here. And um, first of all, more, more media use is, is certainly linked with obesity, either from inactivity or from increased eating. Lots of people um, like to eat while they while they watch TV, for instance. And also it's just the time it's taken away from, from more active activities. So on the one hand, spending large amounts of time with media is making people fatter and, and um, more obese. Uh, on the other hand, the media is promoting the thin ideal and this helps contribute to eating disorders. And so like, you know, it's it's making some children and adolescents fatter, other ones, especially in, in early adolescence, um, maybe buying into the thin ideal that's promoted, particularly young adolescent girls. And this may contribute to eating disorders and, and them trying to become thinner. Um, I'm gonna show you a video about this thin ideal that's promoted in media. Okay, let me just switch over. I think it's an interesting video, so I, I did want to share it with you. Um, give me one moment just to set it up here. Okay. Sometimes people say to me, You've been talking about this for 40 years. Have things gotten any better? And actually, I have to say, really, they've gotten worse. Ads sell more than products. They sell values. They sell images. They sell concepts of love and sexuality, of success, and perhaps most important, of normalcy. To a great extent, they tell us who we are and who we should be. Well, what does advertising tell us about women? It tells us, as it always has, that what's most important is how we look. So the first thing the advertisers do is surround us with the image of ideal female beauty. Women learn from a very early age that we must spend enormous amounts of time, energy, and above all money striving to achieve this look and feeling ashamed and guilty when we fail. And failure is inevitable because the ideal is based on absolute flawlessness. She never has any lines or wrinkles. She certainly has no scars or blemishes. Indeed, she has no pores. And the most important aspect of this flawlessness is that it cannot be achieved. No one looks like this, including her. And this is the truth. No one looks like this. The supermodel Cindy Crawford once said, I wish I looked like Cindy Crawford. She doesn't. She couldn't. Because this is a look that's been created for years through airbrushing and cosmetics. But these days, it's done through the magic of computer retouching. Kira Knightley is given a bigger bust. Jessica Alba is made smaller. Kelly Clarkson, well, this is an interesting, it says slim down your way, but she in fact slimmed down the Photoshop way. You almost never see a photograph of a woman considered beautiful that hasn't been 
photoshopped. We all grow up in a culture in which women's bodies are constantly turned into things, into objects. Here she's become the bottle of Michelob. In this ad, she becomes part of a video game. And this is everywhere in all kinds of advertising. Women's bodies turn into things, into objects. Now, of course, this affects female self-esteem. It also does something even more insidious. It creates a climate in which there is widespread violence against women. I'm not at all saying that an ad like this directly causes violence. It's not that simple. But turning a human being into a thing is almost always the first step toward justifying violence against that person. We see this with racism. We see it with homophobia. We see it with terrorism. It's always the same process. The person is dehumanized, and violence then becomes inevitable. And that step is already and constantly taken with women. Women's bodies are dismembered in ads, hacked apart. Just one part of the body is focused upon, which, of course, is the most dehumanizing thing you could do to someone. Everywhere we look, women's bodies turned into things and often just parts of things. And girls are getting the message these days so young that they need to be impossibly beautiful, hot, sexy, extremely thin, and they also get the message that they're going to fail, that there's no way to really achieve it. Girls tend to feel fine about themselves when they're 8, 9, 10 years old, but they hit adolescence and they hit a wall. And certainly part of this wall is this terrible emphasis on physical perfection. So no wonder we have an epidemic of eating disorders in our country and increasingly throughout the world. I've been talking about this for a very long time, and I keep thinking that the models can't get any thinner, but they do. They get thinner and thinner and thinner. This is Anna Carolina Reston, who died a year ago of anorexia, weighing 88 pounds. And at the time, she was still modeling. So the models literally cannot get any thinner. So Photoshop is brought to the rescue. There are exceptions, however. Kate Winslet has been outspoken about her refusal to allow Hollywood to dictate her weight. When British GQ magazine published this photograph of Winslet, which was digitally enhanced to make her look dramatically thinner, she issued a statement that the alterations were made without her consent. And she said, I don't look like that, and more importantly, I don't desire to look like that. I can tell you that they've reduced the size of my legs by about a third. Bless her heart. So what can we do about all of this? Well, the first step is to become aware, to pay attention, and to recognize that this affects all of us. These are public health problems that I'm talking about. The obsession with thinness is a public health problem. The tyranny of the ideal image of beauty, violence against women, these are all public health problems that affect us all. And public health problems can only be solved by changing the environment. OK. So there is an important message about this thin idea deal that certainly is promoted within media in, in our society. Returning to our PowerPoint. Um, okay, there is certainly, you know, some positives to certain electronic media. Um, as it says here, educational TV improves cognitive functioning and academic performance for some children uh, while entertainment TV makes academic performance worse. So if children are going to spend time watching TV, we, sh we as parents you know, must make sure that they are at least watching quality programming. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, research that's been done on, on Sesame Street in particular because it was one of the first you know, forms of, uh, of TV directed towards children with the, you know, with where they made um, great attempts to make it educational. And uh, they've, they've found very positive results in these studies uh, uh, of children who watch Sesame Street. Uh, just to give you one example, children who watched Sesame Street at the age of five had higher grades in English, math, and science in high school compared to those that did not watch Sesame Street. Uh, one of the reasons is that the, the educational programming produced by the Sesame, Sesame Workshop uses techniques similar to those used in commercials in order to hold the children's attention. So they, they have short segments, uh, they have bright colors, 
they have a lot of music and and these are all beneficial for holding the attention of a of a young child um okay there is no evidence and i kind of i already talked about this a little earlier there's no evidence that media use is helpful for infants infants and toddlers learn much more effectively from real life interaction than from media exposure and it, and so once again no educational media improves upon playing and interacting with an infant or a toddler uh the negative effect effects that they find on of entertainment tv and also video games on academic performance is because time is taken away from academic tasks uh multitasking while doing academic tasks decreases learning as i talked about earlier you do not form the same strength of memories of the material and children who spend the most time with media are more distractible and impulsive in general so it it um it seems there is certainly a linkage between um, uh, attention problems and and um, media use. However, I will say that that the relationship between TV viewing and problems with attention is somewhat unclear because it is based on correlational evidence. So we don't know which is the cause and which is the effect. You know we. The assumption may be that watching more TV leads to more attention problems, but it may be that people that that children that already have attention problems are more drawn to to TV. So the there's certainly correlational evidence suggesting that the two are linked, but we once again we cannot say which is the cause and which is the effect when it's correlational research. Um, Okay, watching violence or taking part in media violence promotes aggression in young viewers. Uh, there's been plenty of evidence showing that, showing the linkage between, once again, mainly correlational evidence, showing the linkage between more hours spent watching violent media or, or playing violent video games and being aggressive. Uh, we have uh, also found the opposite types of links that watching pro-social media, media that promotes helpful behaviors and, and being a good you know child or good person, something like Sesame Street, it increases pro-social behavior. So, um, and this has been shown in, in experimental evidence. Um, so not just correlational evidence, but uh, we can test the pro-social media because it we expect a positive result so we can do conduct studies where we assign children to watch a certain number of hours of pro-social media and then we measure the results on on their actual behaviors we cannot do the same for for violent um, tv though or you know because we cannot conduct an experiment because we expect a negative outcome we have correlational data saying that it, it may be linked with with becoming more aggressive. So it would be unethical to do an experiment where we assign children to watch violent media, you know? So that's why for this first point, we have, we only have correlational evidence. For the second one, we have experimental evidence where we can definitely say, yes, we found that watching pro-social media does increase pro-social behavior. And and the reason they do this, the second kind of research, one of the reasons is that then it makes it much more likely that yes um those that watch violent media this is leading them and causing them to become more aggressive okay and let's go on here um a little just a little data here i'm gonna go through quick um this is a percent of of teens that have access to various communication devices you can see the, the numbers are, are are very high um for you know a, a variety of of communication devices okay i i'm not going to go through the actual numbers here though uh just some more data i'll go through quickly once again now this is showing uh uh gender differences um uh, between boys and girls and and what 
you know, types of media they use. And you can see that there are some sex differences in media use. So the girls you um, like visually oriented social media platforms more than more than the boys, and the boys like to play video games more than the girls. Social media may have some benefits, certainly. Um, helps us to stay in touch with family and friends. It promotes community involvement. Um, there's research that, that it may, you know, that shows that it may contribute to the to creativity and, and the growth of ideas because, because, you know, you can have a collaboration of many people online at once. Um, you can make connections with people from diverse backgrounds. That's certainly beneficial. Um, so there are a number of beneficial uses. Um, but as it says here, it may also expose young people to risks such as sexting, sexting and online predators. So online predators are those that cultivate relationships with their victims over time in order to, in order to establish a trusting relationship online. And then, and then, you know, eventually, you know, trying to, to meet up with them for often for, for sexual purposes in many cases. And, and when we find, and we, when we find that, um, that this is done and, and the person is the, you know, often the older male is met, met up with a younger female. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be that those sexes, but that's the most typical case. I mean, these are, are, are mainly crimes of, of statutory rape rather than forced rapes. I mean, the, the victim is, is willing and wants to meet with the person and, and, and if they have sexual relationships and then she, and the victim's underage, it's, it's a statutory rape. So, I mean, they're not, these are not aggressive forced sexual encounters. they they are they have lured the victims to, to trust them and in order to meet with them um, and that's how you know most online pre sexual predators work um, a little bit about media and self-concept uh, self-esteem can be promoted by shows such as mr rogers neighborhood or daniel T taggers neighborhood and i certainly remember mr rogers neighborhood and um and he always tried to make the viewers feel good about themselves. He would have, you know, he would have them repeat things like, you know, uh, very positive statements about themselves. And you know, he always talked directly to, to the children watching. Um, Self-esteem can be harmed by presentations of a thin ideal. We saw the video on that. Uh, limited self-complexity can, har can harm self-esteem. And what we mean by limited self-complexity is that the characters on TV usually lack depth and they're, and they're stereotyped in one way or another. So they, they find that teens who watch more hours of TV ha have less complex self-images themselves. I mean, they've been, you know, if, you, if you're exposed to a lot of stereotype, you know, shallow characters on TV, then you're not really you're not really being um, encouraged to think about yourself in deeper ways. Um, they also find a lack of diversity and stereotype roles for minority minorities is harmful to minority groups. Uh, one example is that the more media that Latino teens view, the lower the lower their social and body self esteem is. And finally, more than 90% of teens take selfies, <laughs> the effects of which are not yet known. But it, it is hypothesized that this contributes to narcissism. Um, and, and there has been an increase in narcissism, you know, since um, uh, picture taking cell phones have become available. So it's not, it, the link hasn't been established, but it, it, there's certainly evidence that supports that we may be creative narcissism. It's, it's like, you take a lot of selfies, it's like, and you post them, it's like, look at me, look at me. And, 
look at look at what I'm doing and look at what I'm like. I mean, it's 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 very self promoting, and can contribute to a narcissistic view of of being special or better than others. Um, what are some ways that parents can help um, children and teens to use media wisely? Well, one is active mediation and guidance. And this means talking to the child about, about what he or she is watching. So it's not just telling them what they can watch. I mean, you know, that it, it's, it's about, you know, being a participant and, and, and having conversations around what the, what the child watches. Uh, setting limitations on what the child watches. Um, you know, you certainly want to try to um, use some of the television controls available to limit certain stations and certain types of programs, mature, more mature programs from, from children. However, um, if parents, you know, too greatly restrict and control what the children can watch on TV, the programs that they're not allowed to watch sometimes become, you know, forbidden fruit. And they're, they're, they become even more appealing to the children. It's like, why, you know, I'm not allowed to watch this. And so I want to watch it so badly. <laughs> and so they may find ways, you know, uh, around your, your restrictions to, to try to watch what they're not allowed to. Uh, one, one really great thing to do is, is to co-view programs with the child, actively watch with them. And, and, and then you're there to answer questions and to talk about any, you know, mature themes that, that show up in the programs. Um, you know, my, I, I've done this a lot with, in the past with my daughter and, um, you know, as a older child, we started watching, um, Star Trek together all the time, you know, has mature themes and, and, and we went through and we watched every, every show from every, every Star Trek series. So like, it was a lot of, time that we spent together, you know, over, over a course of years watching episodes of Star Trek and, um, and, and we always watched them together. And, and I thought that was very beneficial to, so we could have conversations about some of the interesting and mature themes that showed up. Okay. And uh, finally, media literacy. This provides children with the skills to understand the underlying purposes and messages of media. So teaching media literacy to children and teens can help them become more, more savvy consumers of media content to understand, you know, more about how media works and, and, and just for an ex for example, uh, they find that we can reduce children's tendency to want to emulate movie stars that they see, like, for instance, smoking in, in movies, if if we help the children to learn that that smoking in movies is really a form of advertising. And in that, you know, there, and, and this would also uh, go with, um, you know, movie stars that drink on uh, uh, during the movies. I mean, like, there, most of this is paid for by companies that whatever product they are, they happen to be smoking or, or, or drinking. I mean, like, this this is certainly a form of advertising and, and a lot of people don't stop to think about that but it when you when you make a child more aware of that or a, or a teenager then they're they're less likely to want to emulate those behaviors oh they, they realize then oh the actors doing this because you know they're getting paid to do this on on, on film and this is like a commercial within the movie or the show okay and that will conclude video two from chapter 14.